From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's coming up. K-State's Keith Harris will take a look at the application of distributed ledger technology, commonly referred to as blockchain, to farm data management. He and colleagues are currently researching the practical use of this technology to the ultimate benefit of the farm or ranch. Also, Randall Kowalik concludes his look at a group of students visiting K-State from one of India's leading agricultural universities. Today, the coordinator of the trip, Satish Kumar, and one of the agronomy students who are taking part in this educational experience. Later, K-State's Charlie Lee on the assortment of salamanders found in Kansas and why there are concerns about their habitat. All this and more next on Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Now we will dig into a new article that's been posted on the agmanager.info website out of agricultural economics here at K-State. We talk so many times about this wave of farm data that's available to producers thanks to precision technology. Managing that data has been something of a challenge, to say the least, for producers and others. And so there's a tool that may be used to help not only manage that, but to Purify it, if you will. We'll explain. Keith Harris is with us, agricultural economist here at Kansas State University. He's teamed up with his colleague, Terry Griffin, here to put together this paper on what's called distributed ledger technology applied to farm data. And we'll get into what that is here, Keith, because it's caused some interest out there amongst farmers and others in the industry, you say. Absolutely. I'll tell you, this is one of these technologies that... I have never seen a technology that has moved so quickly in such a short period of time. So it's got a lot of interest in in the marketplace. And the distributed ledger technology, even people may identify it as blockchain. That's another sort of a synonymous term um, in this case. Uh, So blockchain technology is really caught on fire. And I think it started in about 2009, coming out of the financial crisis, where there's those that wanted to circumvent the banking industry. And that's where we get terms like the Bitcoin and things of that nature. Well, essentially, Bitcoin is basically operates or runs on a blockchain, right? So what we're thinking about doing now, or at least I would say what's going on in industry right now, is that we're trying to take that same blockchain technology and not necessarily use Bitcoin for it, but use it for other purposes. So that's how this thing sort of grew in this case, is that it's like, here's an opportunity to take a new technology. And blockchain is simply a technology, and a technology that enables people to do what they've been doing all along. It just makes them a bit more efficient. And I, I think that's sort of the crux of any technology, right? It just right. It enables one to do their job or whatever they they are seeking to do better than what they're able to do. Uh, that could very well, well be used in an agri-food supply chain. Well, in lay terms, mm-hmm. what does this ledger technology, or blockchain as it's commonly known, mm-hmm. do? <laughs> yeah, it, um, it's one of which, if we can maybe explain it this way, right now a lot of our data is really housed on one person's computer, let's say, or one network for that matter. So it could be very proprietary data or be data that just one firm uses for that matter. But when you start getting into the distributed ledger technology, you know, you think about your old days when you used to have a, a ledger book where you put your you know, credits and your debits in there and, you know, you had a book that you kept a record of that. Mm-hmm. Then that ledger moved on to a computer for that matter. You just kept all that things electronically. But when you put it on a computer, it's, that's just your computer for that matter. No one has access to it. But when we talk talk about distributed ledger technology or blockchain, now we're talking about having that information available for all the computers out there. And that is how it gets distributed in this case. It's not just one firm that has information, but it's spread across the internet. 
So how does it intertwine then with agricultural data and, and what sort of problem or issue is it attempting to address? Well, yeah, certainly with agricultural data, you know, we've been involved with what we call precision ag, big data. Uh, but what we found in that space, though, is that there's still some concern with the respect to the veracity uh, of the data itself. Uh, we're not always sure if it's the right data that's put in, uh, particularly when we're going through issues of traceability. We want to trace something back throughout the supply chain. So what we found out here is that there needs to be some type of a link, if you will, or some connection that information that's, that's there is accurate, right? I think that's essentially what we're looking at. And we're looking for the network in this case to validate whether that or not that information is correct or not. So right now, we just use perhaps one organization or one certificate authorizer, if, if you will, or someone that validates or says this data is actually accurate as it is. And the, what the blockchain will do in this case is that it uses an entire network to help to verify whether or not that data is correct or not. So that's essentially the tie-in or the link that I can see from the data that's coming from the farm-level data and, and that product will eventually move on to their buyer. So that's, uh, that's why I see the connection, if you will, between the two. Well, you and Terry, and uh, you have a, another co-author, Jason Ward from North Carolina State University, involved in this particular write-up, are looking at the application of this ledger technology at the yield monitor level, mm-hmm. right? Right. That's a starting point. That's a starting point for us, yeah. That's a starting point. And if we can sort of look at this as well, is that all along this supply chain, there's always data that's coming into the, into the supply chain. Mm-hmm. And we're starting to look at it from a standpoint of from a pre-farm gate to a post-farm gate. There's always data that's being exchanged there. And we just want to make sure that, one, and this is what blockchain promises in this case, Eric, is that I like to call it the three T's is what it promises. I want to call it trust, transparency, and traceability. And we can see that trust in that standpoint, traceability, and transparency throughout that entire supply chain from the very beginning all the way to the consumer gets it at the very end when it's been processed or it's been made available for the consumer to uh, eat uh, readily here. So the very first part of that is, in fact, the data that's coming in at the farm level. Maybe it could come from Ag Monitor, any, any source of data with respect to the location of where the product uh, was raised, for that matter. Uh, it, can, it can include, you know, maybe the soil conditions of it when it was, uh, you know, when it was harvested. So mm-hmm. what date it was harvested, right? So whenever there's that change or whatever that may have happened, we want to make sure it's recorded at that point. And once we record it at that point, and then it moves on to the next link in the chain, we want to be able to verify that it is what it said that it was. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's still a pretty large undertaking. What we found is, is that at the farm level, it's a bit more challenging than when we go further downstream in the supply chain. Why so then? So many variables in play? There, there's a, a number of variables. And sometimes, particularly when we start talking about grain, we start commingling grain. Right? And, and when we commingle grain or we have some identity pre- preservation of it because we're making some claim on it. Maybe it's a high oleic acid soybean for that matter, right? We're making a claim on it, and we have to make sure that they segregate it throughout the entire supply chain. But if we're not dealing with identity preserved grain, then we're doing a lot of commingling of our of our grain, right? It comes right from the farm, goes into the elevator, gets blended up, you know, it mm-hmm. moves on to the, the miller for that matter. It gets blended again, right? So now we're going to have to look at this from a batch system, a batch system that might say, uh, this batch comes from this location in this field. It was planted on this date. It was harvested on this date. And these are some of the nutritional requirements that, that, that may exist in it today, right? Whether it's test weight or moisture level or whatever it is that we're taking a look at, at least that information is going to get recorded at that point. Right? You know, after it leaves that point is that point where we see more blockchain activity. I'm still kind of challenged to understand how we can get the blockchain to be involved early on, particularly when product is being commingled. Now, if we're talking about an individual animal, for example, then I think we can do it more so, right? I think you have a better chance of doing it. So grain presents a different challenge for us than what it might be uh, hogs or cattle or... Something that could be singled out and identified. Something that could be singled out and identified, exactly. But uh, I I think what we're going to have to do is almost look at grain as one is uh, from a batch system and somehow making sure that batch is not 
uh, when it's commingled that there's a new batch that's going to be created that is an identifier as what the conditions or what the nutritional value of that grain is now right because it just it just changed i'm gonna give you an example of something that might that might help illustrate sure. that, that piece there as well you know how for example when if you ever order anything from a place like amazon for example amazon will uh, tell you something like maybe ups or somebody like that is delivering your product you can go to ups's website and they give you a tracking number and you can see exactly where that package is in UPS's network. Does that sound familiar? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can you yes. do that very same thing. Well, that's not necessarily a blockchain because that's one firm's system. We couldn't see what happened between Amazon and UPS. We just see it from a UPS perspective. Mm-hmm. So with a blockchain, it, it'll give us visibility all along that chain. And in each step along the way, we can see the information that's been recorded about that product. We could get that information if we wanted to. So, Keith, this distributed ledger technology mm-hmm. and its application is still in the exploratory stage, but it's pretty clear that you and uh, others believe it has a high value, even at the farm level, on down the line here. It does. Farmers are the linchpin to this supply chain. You know, In many cases, I think all along the chain, not, a, not just the farm himself, but along the chain, people ask a common question, how much is this going to cost me? Right. Exactly. But it's, a, it's a, almost a cost benefit. They're using their own type of economic analysis here. This is going to cost me something, but I'd like to know what my benefits are as well. And these are things that are being studied and explored as we these speak. These are things that are being studied and explored as we, as, as we speak. Well, producers, there's a very good write-up on what they're looking at so far here at K-State on distributed ledger technology and applying it to farm data on the agmanager.info website. They're tracking yield monitor data changes with blockchain, and uh, they are coming up with some interesting findings to date, although their work is hardly done. So get a glance at that at agmanager.info. Keith, keep us posted. We'll likely have you back in the future and talk more about this. Many thanks for your time here. Thank you, Eric. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. He is Keith Harris, agricultural economist at Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. We'll return shortly after this over the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Randall Kowalik. Yesterday, we told you about a group of 30 students from India who are visiting K-State for a few weeks. These students are from the Acharya Injiranga Agricultural University, or ANGRAU, a leading agricultural university in India. Continuing the discussion today, we're joined by Suresh Kumar, who is the Director of Extension at ANGRAU, and also by Niharika Vuliganti, a third-year student. Suresh? You're, I guess, I guess you're past the halfway point now of this trip. I don't know. You're getting close to it. Huh. When did you start pulling all this together? Sometime last year or even 2017? It, the process of selecting the students has been started from October 2018. So we have selected the students from third year BSc agriculture based on their grade point, CGPA, cumulative grade point average. So the cream of the students have been selected from the five constituent colleges of our Acharya Anjiranga Agriculture University. These are all the accredited colleges by the Indian Council of Agriculture Research. And we have screened the students based on their CGPA and performance test what we have conducted and based on their participation in the extracurricular and co-curricular activities. So based on the all-round performance of the students, we have selected 30 students from our Acharya Anjiranga Agriculture University to case state. Okay. We should also point out that there are actually two groups here in the United States from ANGRAU, and the other group is just across the fence at Oklahoma State University. Yeah, exactly. 
uh, actually here we have two types of agreements with this uh, memorandum of understanding with these two universities which were very long back and uh, in Kansas State University all the 30 students were selected for the internship programs but whereas in Oklahoma State University we have selected the students for four weeks programs and also the eight weeks programs in the four weeks programs we have taken up only for the skill development and international exposure to the students and whereas for the eight week programs we have selected the students for the entrepreneurial development programs so some of the students have already sent back for four weeks program and so they have already finished their program and they have left to U India and still 10 more students are continuing in the entrepreneurial development program in Oklahoma State University back home you are the sort of the coordinator of, of uh, one of the colleges and your professor what exactly do you do back at, at ANGRAU well, I am a professor of agriculture extension in our agriculture university. I actually teach the undergrad students in the agriculture extension courses like communication, sociology, educational psychology, and all these courses. And once we go back, I can train the students in whatever the a subject they have learned here and whatever the exposure they have got here and they can replicate them and they can use the same thing to the for the benefit of the other students who have not come over here. You mentioned earlier that this is your your second visit uh, to the United States. Uh, how have you how have you enjoyed Kansas uh, so far and 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 what if anything has has surprised you? Yeah, here in Kansas what is exactly surprising me is the kind of uh, climate here. Because uh, we have faced uh, we have faced all the three seasons in one day, which is really a good experience for me, a different experience for me. Mm -hmm. And moreover, after coming over the Kansas, when all our students have been exposed to all the different kinds of uh, research laboratories and the research equipments, it's a unique opportunity what our students have got over here. And the kind of opportunity will definitely be useful for our students to change their outlook. And it's my privilege to bring all the students to s such a prestigious institution. Right. Yep. Niharika? Yes. You are a student. Uh, you're here studying genetics and plant breeding. First of all, how did you get interested in agriculture as a career? You presumably had a number of choices. Yeah. Uh, but you settled on agriculture. Yeah. Until my 12th grade, I didn't know that agriculture has this much importance and agriculture has separate ex educational systems. I even didn't know that. And after my 12th grade, once I came, came to know all these things and I was joined in an agricultural institute that was one of the most reputed institutes in India. And so... When I joined it, even in my first year of undergrad program, I didn't know the importance of that program. After I joined it, I started studying and slowly I developed interest on it and I came to know that agriculture is the backbone of India. Many people are engaged in agriculture. Uh, it's actually India is an agriculture based economy. Uh, most major part of economy is contributed by agriculture. So then I came to know, then I came to interact with farmers and uh, I came, I observed the farms around and then it, it developed interest in me slowly regarding agriculture. And when I kept studying the subjects in agriculture, slowly I developed interest in genetics and plant breeding because manipulation of genes, that's a uh, really creative job and I was really excited to do that. Is this your first visit to the United States? Yeah. This is my first. You give us some impressions. What do you like? What do you like? What surprised you? What's not surprised you? Yeah. You know? That's really exciting because we didn't even expect that we'll be coming to U.S. or not even U.S. We'll be go we didn't expect that we'll be going to some other country for a student exchange program in our undergrad itself. And that was a sudden, uh, sudden thing that came up to us. And we were really excited. And I couldn't, I couldn't even believe that this would happen. But it happened. We are thankful to our professors. We are thankful to our university and also KSU. And even this was my first flight experience when I boarded the flight in Hyderabad. India. That was like a dream come true. That's great. That's great. Now, now, uh, tell us a little bit about your family back home. Invariably, when we have students come here to K-State and they study agriculture, that's because they were raised on a farm. They had an agricultural background. Uh, would that apply to you? Yeah, 
agricultural background in the sense my family is not into agriculture but we do have farms in small holdings my father is into banking sector but we know a little about farming we do have farms but we don't cultivate it uh, we have labors to do that in india and my mother is a teacher before coming into banking sector my dad was working in air force in india that is something like military and so i used to uh, roam all, all over india in the sense mostly the, uh, air force stations were in villages and all so i used to see the farms and all but i never went into the field before i came into undergrad before i entered agriculture you came from a military family in a sense yeah. and you're talking about moving all yeah over because where the where the air force sends you that's where you go you spent a lot of time moving around as a kid and so you saw a lot of different places yeah we saw i saw a lot of different places and total i studied in seven schools until my 10th grade i i kept changing schools wherever my father ha- used to go we had to go there and the main benefit i found it i found is i learned the language different languages and i learned how to interact with people how to get uh, get with them faster how to communicate with them that was really beneficial and it it, it was a great life yeah Yeah, sounds like it. Now, Suresh, I want to ask you a little bit about the sort of extension there in India. Here we have teaching and the education happening at the university. The research happens at the university. And then the information is disseminated to the people all kinds of ways. But traditionally, we had, you know, these county extension offices. Do you have a similar a similar uh, network of, of offices, things like that, extension offices there in India? Yeah, uh, similar to this, but but there is a slight difference as far as the extension systems in India is concerned, especially in our state like Andhra Pradesh. The st- agriculture is a state subject mostly as far as extension is concerned because there is a state department of agriculture where they have similar to this county. There also the, we call it as a mandal where the agriculture officers will be there and we transfer the technologies to them because we train those agriculture officers in by our university regarding the whatever the new technologies we have. In turn, they take up those technologies technologies to implement in the farmers fields that means directly the technology is being implemented by the department of agriculture people mostly as extension is concerned okay okay so it so it's more it's more it's it's more that is something that's more worked through the through the government to the government yeah okay yep okay nahariko where do you see yourself 5 years 10 years from now what would you like to be doing i would be a plant breeder and contributing my part to the research that i take part i take up and i would see myself as a plant breeder uh, completing my masters completing my phd and postdoc then into research best of luck to you on that naharika vulaganti is a third year student at the acharya inji ranga Agricultural University, a leading agricultural university in India. She is one of 30 students visiting K-State this summer to get a close-up look at teaching, research, and extension. We also heard from Suresh Kumar, who is the director of extension at ANGRAU and is the lead coordinator for this visit. It's worth noting again that ANGRAU was founded in the mid-1960s with assistance from K-State and other land-grant universities. that land grant model serving as a sort of blueprint for ANGRAU. Agriculture Today returns after this short break. This is the K-State Radio Network. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services, exploring options, generating solutions. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. 
here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson here. Well, the 2019 wheat harvest in Kansas is edging ever closer to conclusion, as indicated in this week's Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report from the USDA for the week ending this past Sunday. Our topsoil moisture supplies in the state, 7% surplus, 82% adequate, only 11% short to very short. Subsoil moisture at 10% surplus, 84% adequate, and only 6% short to very short. Winter wheat harvest, 80 81% complete as of this past weekend, still behind the 95% for the five-year average. The condition of the Kansas corn crop this week, 56% good to excellent, 33% fair, 11% poor to very poor. Corn silking now at 36%, well behind the average of 56% for the date. Soybean crop condition at 47%, good to excellent, 43% fair, and 10% poor to very poor. Soybeans blooming at 15%, that's behind the 35% average. And the condition of the grain sorghum crop in Kansas, 74% good to excellent, 22% fair, and 4% poor to very poor. Sorghum headed now at 6%. Nationally, as of Sunday, uh, 17% of corn was silking, behind the five-year average of 42%. The the corn condition estimated at 58% good to excellent, and uh, that's up one percentage point from last week. Still the lowest good to excellent rating for this time of year in seven years. Soybean development also remains behind normal last week, as we hear from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. How is the nation's soybean crop developing? We finally, as we come to mid-July, have most of the crop emerged, 95%. That, of course, is behind the five-year average of 99%, and last year's 100%. That was USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey. We're looking at at least 30-point delays in the blooming progress in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, North Dakota, and Wisconsin. Nationwide, only 22% of soybeans are blooming compared to last year 62 percent. However, like corn, we do see uh, an uptick in the conditions. Now 54 percent good to excellent, up a point from last week. No change in the very poor to poor ratings at 12 percent. Last year at this time, we were looking at 69 percent good to excellent and just 8 percent very poor to poor. States with at least one-fifth of soybean acreage rated very poor to poor include Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Now, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook is in for this week's edition of Milk Lines. Mike? Today, I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning fly control around the dairy and really want to concentrate on the two flies that really seem to cause us the most problems when we're talking about confinement dairy buildings, and that would be house flies and stable flies. These two flies look very similar and have some of the same feeding characteristics, but there are also some major differences as well. Stable flies are the biting flies and those that tend to hang on the underside of the animal as well as on the legs and generally cause more irritation to the animal when it comes to issues of feeding as well as milk production. In fact, some studies have shown that stable flies can actually reduce milk production significantly on animals that are affected. It also causes a lot of the bunching in our barns where we see animals congregating to a certain area of the barn during the summer months. So some things that you need to think about as a dairy farmer is how you're going to probably not eliminate because we're always going to have flies around the dairy, but how are you going to control the population so it doesn't really get out of hand? Sorry to say the most important part of this control program that I'm going to suggest involves sanitation. In other words, just cleaning up the manure around the farm. Also, spoiled feeds such as silages and hays that are rotting and next to the ground are also primary breeding grounds for the flies. So a real key part of any fly control program on any livestock operation, for that matter, is just simply removing the fly breeding areas and trying to remove all of that material that may encourage flies to breed. Keep in mind that sometimes there are some things that around the dairy that we don't think about that can be a breeding ground for the flies. Basically, flies require a wet surface or wet material for the larva to develop. So on your dairy farm, as you look at your freestall barns, as you look at the headlocks, look just below the headlocks, 
hit the concrete wall that separates the animals from the feed. If there's feed built up on that, and if that feed becomes wet because you're using feed line soakers to cool your dairy cows during the summer, that wet material can become an excellent breeding ground for the flies. So once you've tried to remove as much of the fly breeding ground as you can around your dairy, what are some other things that you need to think about? Well, you need to think about residual sprays. Those work very well. Some of those are residual. Some of those are simply knocked down. Make sure you understand the different chemicals contained and where can you use those. Some are only to be applied to the premise of your dairy. Others can actually be applied directly to the animal. When fly populations get extremely high, we probably do need to use some knockdown so that we kill the flies that are already mature. However, keep in mind that if we have a high fly population, we also probably have a high population of larvae someplace in a breeding ground. So you might spray for flies today, knock them down, bring them under control, but a few days later you've got a major fly problem again. Again, flies continue to hatch continually unless we do something about removing those fly breeding grounds and then there's also some things that we can do to try to control the flies in those breeding grounds. If we're talking about manure, there are larva slides that can be fed directly to your dairy cattle and calves and other livestock on the farm that will help control the flies that are developing in those manure collection areas. However, it's not a total control program, so keep in mind that even though we may include some of those things, we probably are also going to still need to use some residual fly spray as well as knockdowns to control during the summertime. Use of fly traps can collect a lot of flies, but generally doesn't do a whole lot in livestock barns to reducing the total number of flies. Looks great to see a lot of flies caught on the sticky traps or whatever else we might be using, but you might want to consider using baits or other things as well in addition to those sorts of control methods. And the final thing you might consider on your dairy is fly parasites. These uh, have to be released on a weekly basis, can be of some benefit to controlling the flies because they actually feed on the larvae as they're developing. However, keep in mind that if you're using an insecticide or larvicide that you're feeding to your animals, that insecticide can also be toxic to the parasitic flies that you're releasing. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to consider a multi-prong attack to the fly control program program on their dairy farm. Thanks, Mike. And this is Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about seven tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. This Agriculture Today concludes with our weekly wildlife management segment. Aboard once again is wildlife specialist Charlie Lee of K-State Research and Extension. Charlie, we'll take on a topic that we've never addressed before, salamanders in Kansas. These are a unique critter, for sure. Yes, salamanders are uh, misunderstood, often non-observed critter. Salamanders are often confused uh, with lizards and reptiles. Uh, They may superficially resemble lizards. They do not have scales, and they don't have claws on their toes. They have wet skin or moist skin, and those features are the things that differentiate salamanders from lizards. Lizards would be reptiles. Salamanders would be amphibians. They typically are going to lay eggs in the water or in a very moist location. These eggs do not have shells, and the embryo is not provided with any special characteristics that are common to terrestrial vertebrates. The respiration is is somewhat different and it's accomplished in a variety of ways depending upon which species of salamander we're talking about. Some respire through the skin, 
sometimes by lungs, sometimes by gills, or a combination of all of those. So fairly unique. They do have ribs, which differentiates them from frogs and toads uh, who do not have ribs. Salamanders are often kept by hobbyists or sometimes kept in schools where they're fairly easy to maintain. But when we look at salamanders worldwide, they're in somewhat of a a perilous situation. Because of habitat decline? What? Habitat decline is certainly the primary factor. But keep in mind uh, their habitat includes um, uh, wetlands, uh, moist forested type environments. That's something that's certainly not very common in Kansas. We do have uh, some species of salamanders in Kansas, but moving south and east from Kansas, um, you would have much more diversity in the, the species of salamanders that are found. So how many types of salamanders would we find in the state? Well, I, I think you would probably have about 10 different species um, in Kansas, but the western tiger salamander and the eastern tiger salamander would account for the most of the distribution of salamanders in Kansas. The western would be found in most counties west of the Flint Hills. The eastern tiger salamander uh, looks very similar to the western, but it's smaller. The yellow spots do not form bars like they do in the, the western tiger salamander, but it's only found around the Topeka area. Then we have smallmouth salamanders that would probably be the next most widely distributed salamander. A few species of hellbenders uh, and uh, mud puppy. And then we're in, down in the extreme southeast corner of the state in the Ozark Plateau, we would have two threatened species and two endangered species. Those would be in cave environments. And those are uh, habitats that are also subject to a lot of destruction and susceptible to degradation quite frequently. So do the salamanders we find in Kansas have natural enemies? One would presume so. Yes, yeah, so they are small, so they serve as food for lots of different species that prey on small animals, snakes, fish, turtles. Larger uh, mammals are also going to prey on them. So they have evolved over time to have fairly large numbers of uh, young being produced. But since they have lots of hazards and factors that limit those populations, we don't end up with mass numbers of salamanders found in Kansas. And that's what you would expect because Kansas is not known for having an abundance of wetland-type forested environments. But you consider them valuable in the respect that they serve as what you call a, a sentinel species for habitat change concerns. Well, certainly we need species that give us an indication of the habitat quality. And as wetlands are drained and forests are cut down, we start to see consequences of those kinds of actions. And Removing woodlands is certainly very harmful to salamanders in environments that have limited amount of moist environment anyway. You cut down the shade, that just almost eliminates the suitability of that site for a species like salamanders. It also increases the temperature of, uh, of the soil and again just makes it unsuitable. There is some other information out there that shows that When we destroy wetlands, we start to see impacts immediately in other amphibians, and those typically are going to trickle on up into other species in the food chain that very much depend on that habitat type. Another factor that is a result for the reduction in the number of of salamanders is road mortality. Uh, They move fairly slow. There has been some studies that looked at uh, maybe 3 to 100 percent of salamanders that cross a road don't make it to the other side. Mm. That study was done in New York State in a rural environment, so I don't know how that would apply to something in Kansas, but their mortality rates uh, are very high, probably exceeds 50 to 75 percent. And that's not the only threat that roads create for salamanders. You also have chemicals, salt, 
that's applied to roads, and that can be hazardous. Uh, amphibians uh, with the moist skin are very susceptible to hazardous substances in the environment, whether they're roadside chemicals or farm products, uh, herbicides, and, or other pesticides. In some parts of the world, um, salamanders are used for food. Other parts, they're used for fishing bait. Some places uh, use salamanders to make wine. So there's lots of exploitation of salamanders, and I, I think it's important that we keep in mind all of these species, although they may be seldom seen, certainly have a value in our ecological system. Well, they can be found in Kansas where it's damper, if you will. But again, they deserve more attention likewise as a a component of the ecosystem, the salamander. Charlie, we appreciate the look at this amphibian we find in Kansas. Charlie Lee is a wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Our time's away for today. Thanks for tuning in, and please be back with us this same time tomorrow, won't you? Meantime, a good day to you. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.